My guest for this episode is Andrew Shear. Andrew is a former product management and user experience design leader at eBay, PayPal, HomeAway, and Expedia. He has more than 24 years of experience creating and leading high-performance teams. He now helps founders and technology leaders build and optimize product teams as founder and principal at BravePath. We talk about his career path, how he started his own company, why it's not your average agency, and his employee-first philosophy. This is Invincible Career, and I'm Larry Cornett. So welcome to the show, Andrew. It's great to have you here. Thanks very much, Larry. Happy to be here. So let's start talking a little bit about who you are and what you're doing right now. Uh, so currently, I am founder and principal of a company called BravePath. Uh, we do uh, consulting, coaching, and recruiting for cross-functional product teams. And I, uh, as you know, I'm a career changer, uh, not unlike yourself, yeah. having previously led UX and product teams in Silicon Valley and in tech. So let's talk a little bit about that career path, because it's like you've got a a very interesting background, which I think uniquely positions you for what you're doing now. And we'll talk more about that later. Why, what brave path is doing is very different from typical agencies that people work with, but tell us a little bit about the arc of your career journey and how that took you to this eventual conclusion of launching your own business. Yeah. Well, so if you look at when I was in college, you know, this thing called email happened, uh, so just to put it <laughs> oh, in yeah, that. context for people. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, I got a journalism degree and somewhere fell into the wonderful world of HTML and learning to build websites, which was actually a differentiator back in 1997. That's uh, true. And, yeah. You know, a hundred years ago. Um, and, uh, just gradually progressed to building more skills around that. It really enjoyed the left brain, right brain mix of, of working on websites. And that involved some writing with my journalism background. Uh, mm -hmm. really became obsessed with user experience design and research. And the big uh, kind of inflection point in my career is 2007 when I moved to eBay, had UX leadership uh, position on search, which was like getting an on-the-job MBA in many ways. <laughs> yeah. um, moved over to product management, which really felt at home. I've, I've always kind of been a jack-of-all-trades, master of none, really enjoy trade-off decision-making, that sort of thing. Uh, built the eBay shopping cart there. Um, learn new things in 2010, like uh, agile methodologies and that sort of mm -hmm. thing. Um, came back home to Texas and helped change the business model at Homeway. We got acquired by Expedia. Um, and then along the way, just, uh, you know, kind of got disillusioned and burned out working for a stock price and decided to try something new. So sure. that's kind of the overall yeah. arc. Total of seven Fortune 500 companies I've worked for. Yeah, you and I kind of crossed paths. I was just leaving eBay and you were just coming in and joining eBay. And I remember, I think that's when we met at some kind of design leadership dinner in Palo Alto that's or right. something like that. Long time that's ago. That's right. Uh, we knew yeah. a lot of the same people. And uh, yeah. I don't think either of us went back to that forum, but <laughs> <laughs> I no, do remember meeting. That was a one and done. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about how unique Brave Path is because it's, it's rare to find someone like yourself go into the executive recruiting, headhunting, talent management side of the world with the kind of experience that you have. And I think some of the lessons that you learned during your experience in Silicon Valley as an employee and a leader probably influenced the way that you shaped the vision and the mission and the culture of your company. So let's talk a little bit about how you've positioned this very uniquely in the market. Yeah. So there's, uh, hard to talk about how we're different without getting into the why, but, but I'll start with the, the what and how we're different. Um, I think, first of all, uh, we describe ourselves to people as, think of us as product and technology people who happen to be recruiting instead of recruiters mm -hmm. who happen to know about product and technology. Um, and so the been there, done that aspect of it. And I think, um, I think it's fair to say without, without a blanket statement that recruiting in general is at a minimum very challenging and arguably mm -hmm. just completely broken when the people doing the recruiting haven't done the job before. And so what sure. makes us unique is most UX products, you know, software development leaders 
don't <laughs> pivot in this direction. Right. Uh, but uh, myself and my colleagues had a passion around the people side of, of technology and we enjoy what we do. So we're applying that previous experience and seeing, I think, more effectively with the eyes of, of the hiring manager when we're out there talking with candidates. So there's something that we've talked about, which I think is kind of an interesting focus. I haven't heard it very often. And that is the idea of putting the employees first. Mm -hmm. So we, we've all heard customer first. And now I think Dan Price is one of the few people in the industry that I've also heard challenge that notion saying, I think that's been a really destructive kind of philosophy. The customer's always right. The customer's yep. always right. So you have a bit of a different twist on this. And we've talked a little bit about it before of take care of your employees, make sure that that's a really healthy relationship and the organization's healthy and, and the rest will follow. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Cause I think that kind of ties into a little bit of your why. Yes, absolutely. So I want to give credit where credit's due that Richard Branson is the quote about, I'll, I'll butcher it here, but take care of your employees. They'll take care of your customers. And when you take care of your customers, you know, the shareholders mm -hmm. will follow. Okay. So uh, give credit to him for, for encapsulating it that way. But um, basically I, um, in my career, I was, I've been fortunate uh, to learn from some really smart people who I think are not well-rounded people leaders. Um, so I was fortunate to learn intellectually about the, the skill, the craft, the discipline, the industry. Um, but I didn't see as much uh, strength in people leadership, understanding humans, uh, motivating them, getting the most out of them. And, uh, and I think I've just seen too many cases where you're, the reason you're not achieving your objectives is because the people are miserable. Um, right. And I think yeah. part of the ethos of Brave Path is, you know, life is too short to be miserable at work. And even from a selfish, if you like, business perspective, happy employees are going to be a whole lot better at what they do and will produce better business results in the long term. Right. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about what it's like to work with you. So, I mean, you, you end up working both sides of the table. Primarily, you're working with the companies that are looking for talent. And so they retain you and hire you, but you also obviously end up working with the candidates too, as part of that candidate experience. So what does that yep. look like? I guess from both sides, what does it look like for someone to work with you when you're helping them find talent? And what's it like for a candidate to encounter you <laughs> first touch? I don't know if it's LinkedIn other places that you look for people, but what is that like too? Yeah. So first of all, I think we, we approach everything we do. It's a, it's a relationship business. And so and that means intrinsically that it's not a transactional uh, basis. So we, we try to take the approach of helping the person in front of us, even if there's not a 30, 60, 90 day window uh, line of sight for us making money from, right. from doing the right thing. So um, sometimes that means talking to a client, giving them a potential client who's not ready to engage us and giving them some advice. Um, but particularly on the candidate side, but when we meet with people, we want to treat them the right way and give them a great experience, A, because we know our competition isn't doing that, uh, B, it's the right thing to do, and C, right. yeah. um, the long-term relationships, uh, I can't tell you, especially when we're working on leadership roles, um, we, we're working with a candidate today who could be a client tomorrow. So even if, they right. Don't, That's right. even if they don't get a job through us, and so that means uh, treating people the right way and doing, you know, things like ghosting have become way, way too common in the recruiting world. Yep. <laughs> and, uh, and just by, uh, for example, if somebody's in a third round interview and then, you know, they're being cut loose and they're not the right person for the job, we use as high touch of a channel as possible. Uh, mm -hmm. timeliness comes into play, but generally speaking, we want to at minimum have a phone call and provide feedback. And I can't tell you how many times just the simple act of providing oh a goodness. little bit of detailed feedback, yes. it, the candidate <laughs> is so grateful for it. So, so that's kind of one of the things that I think makes us different is um, you know, on the front end, most people notice we're different because we understand product and technology. And then on the back end, the way we treat people, we've got some great Google reviews from people who um, you know, did not get a job from us. But they're like, these guys know their stuff and they treated me the right way. So we're, we're really proud of that. Oh, that's really good. Let's talk a little bit about that feedback issue. So that's a huge one. And I work with people 
um, career coaching, trying to help them find jobs. And it's one of the biggest pain points that people have is that they'll go all the way through the process and sometimes it doesn't work out and they'll say, okay, let me know where it went wrong. You know, what could I learn for next time? And probably 90% of the time, the company, the team, you know, the whoever's managed it from inside the company is like, oh, I'm sorry, we can't provide any feedback. And I get that from being inside the corporate world. I remember legal. I kind of remember the day this happened. <laughs> where le- the legal team sat down with the recruiters and HR and us and said, guess what? No more feedback. Don't tell Canada. You can tell them, obviously, you're not moving forward, but don't give them feedback and tell them why, because they were so terrified of lawsuits. So it's become a huge pain point and in a source of irritation for people that they never can learn and tune the way that they're presenting themselves and interviewing. So how do you, how do you deal with that? How do you work around that? I guess you're in a somewhat unique position that you're not the actual employer Do you feel like you're more free to give that feedback. Yeah. First of all, Larry, you know, the irony is when you don't provide feedback, the candidate's going to make up their own reasons. And sometimes that'll be worse than the truth. Oh yeah. So yeah, it's, it's that, sad. That's, yeah. that's the irony is you, <laughs> you might actually be more likely to get sued by, by not saying anything. Maybe. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, all right. So, so I think, um, you know, you, you certainly identified one, but what are the other reasons that feedback doesn't happen? First of all, I think one is sometimes you've got a busy hiring manager that doesn't feel like they have time sure. to tell the recruiter anything other than no. So I think it starts from the beginning. We, when we meet mm-hmm. with our clients, we align on the fact that we all agree we want to provide a great candidate experience for their brand and our brand. And so, and if, you know, Theoretically, if a client isn't willing to do that, then they're not the right client for us. But um, so having a, a client who we're working with who's committed to providing the feedback, first of all, um, making sure it's objective feedback, not purely perception based, things like that. Um, and then, uh, you know, um, it, it's important for the recruiter to calibrate with that hiring manager. Mm-hmm. Um, you just said they don't have much experience in B2B, but actually they've got 10 years of experience at B2B. Let's talk about that. Right. So that that's helpful as well. But when it comes down to the candidate, I think um, when you are specific, um, even if they disagree, they will appreciate hearing it. And I think the really smart ones know that there's always a little bit of perception or always a little bit of, sure. oh, I know I botched that one question and, <laughs> you know, and they wish they had a do over, but I mean, without exception, the candidate thanks us for the feedback, even if they disagree yeah. with it, yeah. um, because they know it helps them for the next, uh, the next interview. So, um, so I think the other thing is, this is a, an advantage we have because we're not the employer, is we, when we share that feedback with them, sometimes we will help them think through why. Like, um, right. I think you're you know, your answers were just too long and they got lost in the details or sure. maybe you highlighted something that, you know, we had talked about, you should have highlighted this instead. And I think that reinforced a perception. So when you show them that you're on their side, uh, that you have their best interests in mind and you're um, coaching them through the process, not just showing up at the end to, to write the Dear John letter, um, I think uh, that helps it, uh, helps the whole process as well so that they're not overly defensive. And then the final thing that sometimes we do worry on our team, like, ah, oh, we're dreading the, the defensive response, right? Sure. Uh, yeah. what, if, what if they're going to try? I've done this before as a candidate where I want to argue with a recruiter. <laughs> because, no, that's not me. So I, I can totally <laughs> identify with it. But what, um, what we'll do sometimes is we'll say, we've decided to focus on candidates who have more of X, Y, or Z. When you say it that way, it's still truthful, it's still accurate, it's still honest, but it's said in a way that no one can argue with because right. you don't know mm-hmm. who the other candidates are who we're talking to. So I, I find that that's a way of describing it that uh, makes it, it's still constructive, it's still specific, but versus if I said, Larry, you, you only, have two years of experience in X, then you might argue why it's actually five instead right. of me saying we're talking to candidates who have more. more. Uh, and so it's still uh, understandable without being something that's easily argued. So I think that helps sometimes. Yeah. 
That's such a good point. And, and I've talked with some folks about this where it's like, they feel like it's kind of a black and white. That candidate must've been great. I must've been terrible. And I said, I've been on the hiring manager side and sometimes you'll be sitting there looking at three candidates that are all great. They're yep. all great hires and there's nothing wrong really with any of them, but it's coming down. You have three candidates and you have one rec, you have one position to fill. And it can be the tiniest thing that says, well, I guess because of the project that one person worked on might be a better fit for what I think we're going to assign this person to. And that's why you go with that candidate. So sometimes I have to tell people, it's like, you may not have done anything wrong and you may be a fantastic fit, but they only have one position and somebody just had a slight edge, whatever it might be. And that's hard to swallow too, but at least it's like, no, there's no huge flaw that you have or anything that you did wrong in answering the questions as we do a bit of a debrief. But it's, it's interesting. I think it's a great point because the outcome of all of these things is binary when the reality is it's not so black and white. Yeah. Um, And I think uh, sometimes the most frustrating feedback can be something that sounds like um, the answer is no, because it's not yes. Meaning like we need to be yeah, super excited yeah. about this person and we're just not quite there. This role is so important. Um, and I see hiring managers struggle with, they need, they all want a more objective, like as, as sure. objective as possible of a, uh, an answer. But sometimes it's just legitimately, you're looking for things like leadership presence and can this person inspire the team? And those are right. intrinsically yeah. subjective, but no less important. And that can be really hard. Right. Yeah. Just a sense of confidence. Yeah. Yeah. The, you kind of touched on something that I think we've discussed a little bit and that's the concept of, you know, perception is reality. And it's, it's a little hard, I think for people sometimes because their first reaction is like, well, that's not true. Uh, you know, they seem shy. Well, I'm not shy. That's not true. Or, you know, you made a mistake yeah. on this. It's like, actually it wasn't a mistake about, and it, sometimes people just have a hard time accepting that because in their mind, it is black and white. It's like, well, that's false. Therefore, it shouldn't be any kind of a reason to have an issue or not move forward or whatever it might be. But you've probably experienced this both from kind of the side that you're on now with your company, but back in the old days, back in the, the world of running tech teams, what are sure. some of the things that you've encountered coaching people through understanding that perception does matter? Yep. So... um I I put a lot of thought into how I've done performance reviews over the years, and uh, there's a lot of components to that. But one of the ones that I encourage people to adopt is a a simple two-by-two matrix on how to classify feedback you receive. Mm. The first question is, do I believe that this feedback is true or false? And then second, uh, do I believe it's important or not, yes or no? So the, the really obvious one is, yes, it's important, yes, it's true. And this is all for like constructive feedback. Well, then obviously I need to work on it. The one that trips up a lot of people is this is not true, but it's important. Uh, And so, for example, I have I've put 360 comments in someone's performance review before I let them read a particular comment and they're like they start to get worked up. But I'm like, by the way, I disagree with this person. I'm not telling you I agree with it. Well, then what's it doing in the performance (laughs) review? Because. Uh, this is coming from, I heard this from multiple people, or I heard this from someone right. with the power to block your promotion, you know? Right. And so you have a perception issue. I agree with you. It's not true, but we can't ignore it because this is a, an important issue. And so now you and I are going to work together. We got to run a little PR campaign here. <laughs> and this is yeah. where people, people, some people are like, I don't even want to work at a place where that's a thing. Well, it might be that's, less that's of an called issue life. A smaller <laughs> that's right. That's exactly right. Um, and, and as we were discussing right before we came on today, um, I also tell people, you have to let this sink in a little bit. As you climb the career ladders, you move yeah. into more senior roles, it gets less fair, not more <laughs> fair. It's right. less objective. It's, yeah. You now have potentially people who work, like managing managers is a big first, you know, big sure. step for people because now you have people who are going to base their perception on you when you only see them 15 minutes a month, you know? Right. And so um, perception can be really important and it's important to acknowledge that it doesn't have to be true for me to take ownership of doing something about it. And yeah. so um, we may find that you are sort of nemesis at work is somebody we're going to need to spend more time with to try to correct a perception problem. And then uh, 
just to round out the matrix, there's um, things that are not true and not important. Right. You know, so that's the crazy person who gave you some feedback. We're just going to ignore it. Uh, and then what's the last one? Uh, things that are true, but not important. Like, right. Right. yes, I tend to be a few minutes late to meetings. Is that really, you know, whatever it is that right. I'm sure that's a yeah. pet peeve for some people, but <laughs> there'll be things that, yeah, I've been that way since I was eight. I'm not going to prioritize that even though it's true and you and your manager are on the same page. Yeah. That's not the biggest issue for us to work on. So that rounds out the categorization of feedback. I think people tend to think it's either something I got to work on and therefore true, or it's not. And that binary uh, classification is too harsh. I think yeah. there's a lot more subtleties yeah. and working with your manager on how to approach it is important. You know, it's funny you mentioned that the higher you climb, the more important this becomes. Um, and I won't name any names or name a company, but I do remember a, an individual who's being groomed for a CEO position. So they were the successor to the CEO. Capable got results, you know, smart person, but the perception of this individual with the outside community, like our user base and all that yep. stuff was that don't like them. I mean, it was really just, just don't like them. I, they don't seem nice. They don't seem genuine. And it was such a common perception. Like it wasn't, Oh, a few people feel this way, but most of the community f just did not like this individual. And they ended up it ended up kiboshing their attempt to become the successor as the CEO simply because people said, eh, I just don't like them. <laughs> so it's like, if you think this stuff doesn't matter, it could be a make or break moment for you to become a CEO of a, of a rather large company. Um, it is, it's about EQ. It's about how people feel when they're around you, how you communicate. It is your professional brand and I won't use personal branding because I feel like that has a negative connotation for a lot of people, but I do believe in professional branding. Like who are you as a professional? Are you trustworthy? Yep. Are you reliable? Do I enjoy working with you? And that is important. I'm sorry, folks. Um, people hire people they like. And it's I, even when they don't know they're doing it. I will say, I do think it's fair to say it does matter in some roles more than it does others. Like, yes, if yeah. you're just um, an amazing analyst uh, who can spend most of your day, you know, with the headphones yeah. on staring <laughs> at a spreadsheet, like people don't need to like you as much if you've yeah, always mean got never the answer. know who you are. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but if you <laughs> it, uh, if you're going to sit in the CEO chair, you're going to have to shake some hands and, and massage yep. some relationships. And that's just part of the job. So I, I do think as people explore which careers are best for them, mm. that can be part of it. If you really hate that stuff, if you really hate right. the That's fact that perception matters, there are places you can go <laughs> that minimize it. That's absolutely true. No, that's a that's a great point. Yeah, you don't like that, then don't don't play the game. It's like, okay, just go somewhere else and play a different game. Or as I've told some people that have a really strong feeling about this in company culture, it's like start your own company. If you feel this passionately yeah. about it and you are this upset that you can't change the culture of this massive 30,000 person organization, <laughs> go start your own company and you absolutely can do that. It's absolutely possible. Uh, um, you you so actually look, had a, a great, sorry, you, you had a great metaphor from years ago, an article I read from you about, uh, I'll paraphrase, but basically if you're frustrated climbing the mountain that you're on, you might actually be on the wrong freaking mountain, right? Like yeah, exactly. You, yeah. We all have a achievers have a tendency to want to go up, you know, right. on the mountain right. they're on. But when you find that not satisfying, sometimes you just you may not be on the wrong, you may be on the wrong mountain, and just switching that yeah. can be a yeah. lot more satisfying. Uh, I mean, that's why I did what I did. I was frustrated with company culture, and I kind of realized I'm I'm being a hypocrite by complaining about it inside or at least inside my own head. I'm like, well, if I'm so yep. good at this and I think it's so important, I'll go create my own culture. I'll create my own company. And I did, you Thank know, you. it's like, it was that important to me. Yep. So what advice do you have? And you gave a little bit here, but I, obviously I would bet you do a little bit of coaching with some of the candidates that you're putting forward because you sure. have a very rigorous process. By yep. the time you get to a candidate you want to put forward to one of your clients, you vetted them quite a bit. Yep. So what kind of coaching do you tend to give people and what are the 
the positive things you've seen that it's like, this is great. This worked really well. And, and what are some of the mistakes that candidates make? You know, the first thing that I think um, my advice to people, including very senior people, they just don't practice it enough. Oh, I <laughs> and know. so, so like uh, my advice to everyone is interview somewhere once a year, even if uh, oh, you're yeah. happy where you are. There's a yeah. lot of benefits to that we could we could list, but that's that's the first thing. The second, um, I think um, some common mistakes that I see. Uh, one is I know this sounds so simple and so tactical, but people have long winded answers. They feel the need yeah. to anticipate every follow up. And I tell people like the the right metaphor is it's more like a tennis match. Of oh, you, that's good. You give a little mm -hmm. bit, they give a little bit. You want some interaction, and there's some tricks I give people. Tricks, it's nothing fancy, but for example, you could say something like, uh, "I have two examples that would illustrate what you're asking about. Would you like to hear the more recent one, or would you like to hear it?" Because sometimes we'll, right. we'll hear from right. hiring managers. Man, every one of Larry's answers was about eBay. I was tired of hearing yeah. about eBay. Yeah, exactly. Well, but you didn't tell the candidate that. So the candidate could say, like, I have another example that's from eBay, or I could give you a homeboy example. Which would you rather hear? Um, you could, the, mm -hmm. but the real big one is like just saying, here's a two sentence overview of the project that answers your question. I can elaborate on any of that that you'd like me to. And then right. you let them uh, talk about it. So that's a really common interview skill that's off. Um, but I also think that. Um, what, what I will typically do, there's a, there's a line as a recruiter to over coaching the candidate. Sure. You don't want to oh, yeah. give them yeah. the answer key. <laughs> but what I will do is highlight for them what I think their biggest strengths are and what aspects of their background are less relevant to this position. Mm -hmm. uh, because um, a lot of times the candidate feels like they're flying blind. So uh, giving them feedback on, I really liked your answer about this. That would be a good story to tell. You know, things like that can be really helpful and um, very much appreciated because interviewing is very often very lonely. You know, you, yeah, um, yeah. you your current set of colleagues are usually off limits to talk about these things with. And so um, I think giving them feedback along the way. Uh, is important. Yeah, that's a good point. I try to remind people it's, it's a conversation. This shouldn't yes. feel like you're across this, the table from a police detective who's grilling you, right? Which some interviews can feel that way. And that's, that's not fun. And it's not a good sign. And, uh, I was and just not telling a somebody, presentation. Yeah. Conversation, not Yeah, a exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's a conversation. Yeah. I, was, I was telling the potential candidate yesterday, and I said a very nice strategy to make this feel more conversational and kind of retain your power as a candidate is every time you answer a question, follow it with a question you have for mm -hmm. them that's relevant. So somebody will say, oh, tell me about a time that you had a challenge convincing your boss to do something for a project and you answer it and then dovetail that saying, well, how are decisions made at this company? If an employee disagrees with a manager, what do you guys do about that? And there's a couple of things. One, if they shut you down, they're like, hold all your questions to the end, red flag, I'm sorry. Yeah. And I'm going to say that because I'm kind of outside the whole thing. It's like, if they cannot let you have a conversation, they're that controlling red flag. Um, but the more you can make it feel like a conversation so that they are trying to sell you on the organization, like, Hey, we're a good organization. We have healthy processes and relationships. You're going to get the answers you need to feel comfortable and say, this is a good place to work. So I was telling people, it's like, make it a conversation, ask your questions. Obviously it should be relevant. But don't just sit there and, and kind of recite your answer back and then stop and wait for the next question. It's like, it just feels so unnatural. Totally Not agree. Fun. Good Not advice. Fun. So for companies that want to work with you, how can they find out more about you? I guess we haven't talked about your domain, where you guys are located, and you're, on, you're all over the place. You're on LinkedIn and other places. So where can they find out more about you and how can they work with you? Yeah, uh, they can uh, go to bravepath.co, uh, our website. Uh, we're also pretty active on LinkedIn, uh, the Brave Path uh, LinkedIn page, uh, me personally on LinkedIn. Um, and, you know, a, a lot of our conversation today has been about recruiting, but we also do uh, coaching and consulting. Yeah, I think that's let's talk a little bit about that. Let's, yeah. I actually wanted to touch on that. So you do something very unique in offering this follow-on coaching and organizational coaching, leadership coaching. So let's, let's, let's touch on that because that is very unique to you. 
Yeah, we have a, a couple of us. We're a small team, uh, five people, but two of us, uh, former product leaders, uh, do coaching. My colleague, Jenny Koo, uh, tends to coach uh, individual contributors and more early career folks, maybe folks that want to become PMs. Right. Uh, I, uh, I've coached more senior people. It could be people who are, feel like they're stuck and not getting mm -hmm. ahead and looking for a promotion. Or um, also coach people who, you know, maybe they're recently laid off. Um, do they want to go the route of a GM or a PM or consulting right. or what would be best for them? So just like what you do, Larry, you know, being a guide, uh, often reflecting back to them mm -hmm. uh, what they're saying, helping them process things, helping them prioritize. Uh, I find it's funny how often someone will say uh, when you I like to help people build a filter for the type of job that would be right for them. Mm -hmm. And then you ask them separately, go find a job that's interesting to you. And they will often pick one that just fails all the criteria they just described. So <laughs> it's true. Um, it's, um, it, it's just being a guide and helping them through mm -hmm. that. So it can be career coaching. Uh, on the consulting side, uh, something I've, I've had a lot of fun with is uh, I've helped a, a local PE firm here in Austin do uh, due diligence on their investments in online marketplaces. Oh, so, cool. Um, helping them evaluate the talent, the product strategy, et cetera. And this is one of the ways that I stay sharp on the discipline uh, instead of just being 100% in recruiting, right. uh, keeping uh, some of my involvement in the actual product work uh, is helpful for me to stay abreast of what's going on and doing due diligence is a great way for me to see what's happening at other companies, obviously, and that sort of thing. So uh, right. that's the, the scope of what we do. You had asked earlier about like, where, where are we? Um, I'm sitting in Round Rock, Texas, a suburb of Austin here. Uh, we've, uh, we've got a few team members here in the Austin area, but um, uh, my colleague, Jenny, I mentioned is out in the Bay area. Uh, mm -hmm. There are three of us at Brave Path who are former product leaders now. Um, Jenny Koo was a, a product manager at eBay. Um, we've already talked about me. And then Helen Morris recently joined the team. He has Fortune One experience at Walmart and Sam's Club. Wow. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so that's a little bit about the team. We work on with companies across the country before COVID, after COVID, during COVID. <laughs> right. yeah. um, everything is on Zoom. So uh, that's kind of uh, the scope of services and geography that we cover. That's fantastic. Well, Andrew, I want to thank you for making the time to come on the show. It's been a pleasure talking with you and learning more about Brave Path. And anybody who's listening, if you are looking for talent, especially senior tech talent, check out Brave Path at bravepath.co. It's, it's a very different experience than you're probably used to. All right. Appreciate it, Larry. Thanks a lot. All right. Take care. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and if you would like to follow upcoming releases of the show, please subscribe. And as always, I appreciate your ratings and reviews. Thank you. If you would like to learn more about Invincible Career and the podcast, you can visit InvincibleCareer.com. Until next time, I wish you the best of luck in becoming an opportunity magnet for the best things in life. <laughs>